This week in Pure Reinvention. The world is watching Detroit. It's time for us to take control of the narrative. You do that through action, not by talking. This is not an era of talk. Episode 62, Marlo Stoudemire, founder and chief engagement strategist at The Butterfly Effect Detroit. Engage. Disrupt. Adapt. Repeat. You're listening to Pure Reinvention, the podcast for curious people. Welcome to this episode of Pure Reinvention, where we create space for the unexpected by inspiring a reinvention lifestyle. Misty, we're all about Detroit. We are, and I love it because every time I turn around, there's something new to learn. Well, Detroit is such a great place for us to always be showcasing stories about reinvention because every time you look, the city is going through something new. It's people, it's uh, businesses, it's opportunities. Detroit is such a wonderful showcase for reinvention. And Marlo said it best when he said, which is kind of our mantra, Detroit is the classroom for the world. And it really is. Every time we want to look to look to a new example, we can find it on the streets of Detroit. Detroit is being recognized as a place where success is brewing and growing and cultivating. And people from around the world are starting to look at Detroit and wonder, what is the magic that's going on there right now? So I love that we can bring you know these podcasts into your car or your home or into your ears, wherever you're listening, and bring a little bit of that Detroit classroom and Detroit lessons from the people that are there. Make pure reinvention one of those things you always make a point to listen to because the stories of reinvention, mostly around the opportunities that are in and being taught in Detroit, are one of a kind. Well, how about we let everybody hear what Marlo has to say because he can teach us a lot about Detroit today. Fantastic. This episode of Pure Reinvention is sponsored by the Detroit Experience Factory, where they use interactive experiences and innovative resources to help newcomers and locals alike get more connected to the people, places, and projects in Detroit. What a treat today. We're here with Marlo Stoudemire. Marlo is the founder and chief engagement strategist for the Butterfly Effect Detroit. Hi, Marlo. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Marlo, tell me, I'm absolutely curious to know what the Butterfly Effect Detroit is. So Butterfly Effect Detroit is a business and public engagement agency. So we focus on designing and executing engagement strategies that facilitate digital and face-to-face collisions of brands, culture, industry, and opportunity. Uh, We work uh, with targeted groups across public, private, and social social sectors. Uh, And for the most part, we consult with organizations. We provide strategic partnerships. We help social enterprises connect with and help other people, primarily based in Detroit and select communities. Now, currently, you're working with a big project with the Detroit Historical Society. Yes, um, this is probably the biggest thing that I've ever done. Uh, Detroit 67, looking back to move forward is a project that's being convened by the Detroit Historical Society. It's commemorating the 50th anniversary of Detroit's historic summer of civil unrest in 1967. And it really presents a unique opportunity for the region to recall and reflect on what it has learned, right? How we got there, where we are now, and most importantly, where we're headed. What's the work that needs to be done to move us forward? And what's really interesting as I listen to you talk about that is how incredibly important understanding those steps are for all of us in our journey. No matter what our reinvention is, uh, that's, a, that's a model that we all can follow. Yeah, one of the things that we say, a story this big or an event this big takes all of us. It's incomplete without your story. So it's going to feature diverse voices, programs, and exhibitions that help us bridge gaps in understanding Detroit's past, right? The challenges in the region that we have in front of us. Um, in order for us to reach our full potential is America's great comeback story, right? Uh, the outcome of this will be a model for bringing people together around the effects of a historic crisis to find their role in the present in order for us to inspire the future. You can't do that without understanding where we've been, where we are now, and again, where we're going. You've, you've reduced it to some very simple steps, and I want to get into that. Uh, One more time, I don't think that we mentioned how do people get a hold of you at the um, Butterfly Effect Detroit. Yeah, if people want to get in touch with me, they can visit my website at www.butterflyeffectdetroit.com. So, Marla, we start all of these interviews out with uh, kind of quickly asking you, which of the five steps in the reinvention process do you most align with? 
move. Uh, it's important that we get everybody moved and engaged and going. Uh, it's one thing to engage people and get them to understand kind of the premise of what you're talking about, but then putting it into context so they can see themselves and it activates them. But where real change happens is if you get everybody moving in the same direction, mobilizing. I use the example from uh, back in the 60s, a reporter went to NASA and he asked the CEO, sir, what's your job? The CEO said, my job is to put a man on the moon. On his way out, he asked the janitor, sir, what's your job? The janitor said, my job is to put a man on the moon. We want everybody to see their role in it and get everybody moving forward to help Detroit, the region, and the rest of the country move forward. Uh, Indeed, uh, once we all understand what the mission is, we can all play our own part. What is your superpower? I would say my superpower is the ability to build relationships. In oh, like any that. place in the world. I've traveled all over the world. I've been to Asia. I've been to Europe. I've been on fellowships. I've done business development. And I always try to find what the common thread is. I think what divides us is, is everybody's paying attention to what's different. What I look for is what's common, and I build on that, whether it's food, whether it's music, whether it's a piece of clothing, whether it's you reminding me of someone, I try to develop a common ground. And my power is by the time I meet you the first time, you felt like you've known me your whole life. All of us find ourselves in uncomfortable situations sometimes. Can you tell uh, those people who are listening to us about an uncomfortable situation that you were in most recently? Well, most recently, I think the most uncomfortable position was transitioning from a very high level, high paying corporate job to transition from what I call a life of ambition to a life of passion to be a business owner, to be an entrepreneur, to step out of that front door knowing that it's just me, something that I have to create. It's what I call unleashing my entrepreneurial spirit. And every day I woke up with some doubts. Every day I woke up with with some fear, but I allowed that fear to drive me. And it was very uncomfortable because it's the unknown. It's you. It's not having that paycheck to back you up if you have to take off some days. There are no days off. Uh, And so I consider myself a mobile entrepreneur because I go wherever I need to go to get the job done and I'm going to be entrepreneur on my thinking. But I was very uncomfortable with that because I was used to having a lot of people working for me, a lot of uh, excess resources. Um, But what you learn how to do is you learn how to do what really matters when you're on your own and you learn how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I want to understand from you, Marlo, how did you get into this specific line of work? What is the real passion and the why behind what kind of work you're doing now? Well, it it really starts from coming up from humble beginnings, you know, growing up in one of the toughest neighborhoods, not only in Detroit, but in the country. It's the 40205 zip code and seeing the effects of a of an environment that, that, that has low expectations for quality of life, what you can be, what you should be, who you can be. Uh, those things had a real strong impact on me. But being a student of culture, being able to understand that change doesn't happen with me sitting on my couch shaking my head saying that's a shame, it starts with me. Uh, one man can make a difference. And I think that that's really what motivated me to say I wanted to have more meaning behind my work. I think I would have never been able to do that had I not had a chance to taste success, had I, had I not had a chance to sit in a C-suite and see how I can really make a difference for a $4.5 million a year organization, billion dollar a year organization like Henry Ford Health System, and really realize that my work matters. So transitioning from a life of ambition to a life of passion is all about doing the things that have meaning to me and hoping I can connect with someone. Not necessarily trying to design for everyone, because they say if you design for everyone, you design for no one, but picking an area and a niche of people that I identify with. And that starts with the community. The concept behind Butterfly Effect is the notion of a butterfly flapping its wings in one part of the world and causing a hurricane two weeks later. And so I always say your small beginnings now can have greater impact later. And that's my life. What I had to do, literally, I had to go through a state of metamorphosis. I believe that everything that I ever needed to be successful throughout the years of learning, growing, experiencing, failing, succeeding was already inside of me. But I had to go into a cocoon. I had to transition from that thinking of an employee, diversify my network first, 
Second, identify with a specific culture. And then third, unleashing that entrepreneurial spirit so I'm not dependent on being in a job. So I'm not locked into constraints of someone else's agenda. That's freedom. And so my objective is, is for Butterfly Effect Detroit to be an incubator of people and for all people to learn from me as the case study to find out who they are and identify the butterfly inside of them. How do we instill in other people to help them understand that these what appear to be very small and at the time very inconsequential steps really do accumulate into something very powerful? Yeah, it, it's really that relationship side that I talked to you about through diversity and inclusion on one point, but then also connecting with something that's very specific. It's what I say, people, places, and experiences, and exposure, inclusive exposure, giving people an opportunity to participate, right? So if you think about the 67 Project, right, the most important aspect of all of this, and it's really cool, we have an oral history that we're collecting, we have an interactive exhibit, we have hundreds of community partnerships. We have calls to action. But the most important thing is we're allowing people to listen, be heard, participate, and take action. And you have to remember, everyone's not going to be an architect, right? But if you give people, people a way to participate and open a door or provide select menus of opportunity and options, people will find their way. But you have to continuously make the invitation. The project will cover approximately 150 years. First, we'll reflect on the people, places, and events that define Detroit during the 100 years between 1917 and 2017, specifically focusing on those transformative events that occurred during the summer of 67. Um, And then after that, it's the 50 years that lie ahead from 2017 to 2067, with a primary focus on having people take on levels of action to transform, reimagine, reinvent, uh, repurpose the environment around them in the now so we can shape the future. Okay, so let's stop right there. In the, in the macro journey, mm-hmm. the most important focus once we understand the history is what are we going to do going forward? Is that what I heard you say? That's absolutely true. And the key about it is, is that as a historical museum, uh, whether you're a business leader, it's not us to define that for people. It's us for, for it's up to us to give the imperatives that are critical, mm-hmm. lift up current conditions, mm-hmm. tell the truth, give accurate information, be transparent, and then identify those who are already doing great work and those who want to do new things and bring people together. In the process of doing that, we create role models for not only others in the community to watch in the region, in the state, but the country and the rest of the world. The world is watching Detroit. It's time for us to take control of the narrative. You do that through action, not by talking. This is not an era of talk. I don't want to be involved with anything regarding just talking. Action speaks louder than words. And I know it sounds like a cliche, but it's true. So how do you connect with something this big Right and meaningful on a national level, but also make it intimately meaningful enough to provoke action in a neighborhood where people are dying for opportunity, for economic inclusion, for bridge building and race relations. You know, one of the things I always talk about is we're going to bridge some gaps. And there's three gaps that I think about all the time. It's the cultural gaps that we have in this city, country. It's the geographic or regional gaps that we have and the generational gaps. We have to find a way to bridge those so we can work together. There's no way in hell we're going to reach 2067 looking good if we don't start now. There's a lot that needs to be done. And I think that's also in root, being rooted in bringing people together for everyone to understand, to lift up the fact that, you know what, it's not always a rosy picture, but that doesn't mean we stop trying. That doesn't mean we stop working together, right? The momentum is important. Detroit's experiencing a little bit of momentum in the greater downtown, midtown area, but there are people in neighborhoods who don't feel it. It's not real for them. How do we engage those people? So I want to go back to to some of the things that you talked about. And I want to start with three words, and I want you to fill in what's rest. Okay. Because you alluded to the fact that you've done a lot of traveling in your uh, life. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to start with these three words. You take, take it from there. Traveling teaches us... How to be students of culture and understand the way the world works outside of our comfort zones. It teaches us to understand 
or learn how to let go. You're not in control, right? And so the most important aspect is really being selfish enough to use it as a tool for learning, but not just a tool for learning in the moment. What can you bring back? You know, and that's the school I come from. There's no value in me having knowledge if I'm not sharing it. There's no value in the historical society trying to keep a history inside of the walls of the museum and not give it back to the people. Traveling teaches you that in a different type of way. It teaches you to be tough, learn how to be agile, be uncomfortable, and appreciate the what I call the tapestry of life. The other thing that you mentioned, which I found absolutely interesting, was... Um, You talked about the butterfly effect, your company, being about collisions, small collisions. Mm -hmm. One of the things we've learned is there's a law in in the universe called the frequency of collisions. And and I I want you to speak a little bit about why collisions are are so important. It's it's, it's critical because everybody pretty much operates in a space that they're comfortable in. You know, we have our day-to-day routines um, and... We navigate around each other. I feel like we kind of work around each other. My objective is is to create these collisions or what I call portals of engagement that forces a conversation, puts a visual in front of people, lifts up a particular cause. So it's not you're going around it. It's something that you have to deal with. Either you have to say, yeah, I saw that. That's pretty cool. Or I need to do something about that, right? But it's also connecting the dots. Top down, bottom, up. And that's why the whole NASA reference is so important because everyone needs to see their role in it. And sometimes you have to force that with the collision. And at the core of all of this, you know, people say, oh, you're, you're a social catalyst. And I say, thank you. Because at the end of the day, if I'm not helping, whether it be a nonprofit, a business, an entrepreneur, or select communities connect with and help other people, I'm not doing my job. You know, I just did a project with J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Detroit Service Corps program, where they bring in executives from all over the world and do pro bono consulting. And I was managing that on the ground with another partner out of D.C. And they just recently said, you know what, this was successful. We want to expand it. We want to bring somebody in internal on this. That's success. I don't need that contract. I don't need the money. The fact that we made it work in Detroit and they want to use it beyond Detroit, that's change. What is the difference between engagement versus movement? I think engagement is more about awareness and getting people's attention. You can get people's attention all day long, but if you don't find a way to activate them and actually give them a way to participate, they're not moving. I can stop you in a corner and say, this is a great day, isn't it? And you can say yes, and you can keep going. I can say, this is a great day. Look at that bench over there. Look at those kids. Look at those dogs. Why don't you walk over here with me? Let's enjoy this day together. And I know it sounds very simple, but it's literally provoking and suggesting an action. It's a call to action. That's where the movement comes from. You can ask someone a question and they can say yes and keep going, or you can ask someone a question and say another question and another question to get them going. Whether you're moving a conversation, whether you're moving people, whether you're moving the needle on a social issue, move starts with more than just one step. Engagement is the first step. So while we think that, or many people are saying engagement is the last step, right? Mm-hmm. I've told my story. Mm-hmm. Now somebody else has to carry the ball. You're, what you're suggesting is engagement is only the first step, and now you have to worry about who's carrying the ball, how far is it going, what's next, what's next, what's next. It's making sure that movement, that continues on. Not only that, it's, it's the narrative, it's the story, right? The reason why social media is so powerful, because you're able to move content unrestricted across any type of medium of land, sea, border, uh, time zone, it doesn't stop. That's why it's so powerful. So if you can get something or create something that moves continuously while you're sleeping, then you're winning a message a plan, a community. Henry Ford uh, said that, you know, I didn't ask people what they wanted when it came to the automobile because if I asked them that, they'd say we want faster horses. (laughs) And I could be (laughs) quoting that wrong, but the point is is that you have to kind of anticipate it, Mm -hmm. right? What's going to move us forward? Is it going to be enhancing something that's been around for a while or creating, reimagining, or transforming something for the future? A lifetime that we may not necessarily be here to benefit from. But I think that's our duty. You made a comment about the city of Detroit and the 
work that's being done and the fact that there are a lot of people watching Detroit. Can you, can you speak to the importance of, of why our individual energy matters and the scope to which people are watching even the smallest things that are going on? The first thing that needs to be clarified is that Detroit didn't just happen overnight. Uh, you know, people talk about startups. My friend Dave Eckner always talks about what about the bin ups, the people who have been holding the city together long enough for there was a foundation for a downtown and midtown. So let's get that straight. There's been good work going on for decades. Right. The momentum and the time is right for us to kind of take that next step from a national stage. So that's number one. Number two is that sometimes when you look in the mirror, you're, you think you're a little uglier than what you really are. And some people actually think you might be a little prettier. The rest of the world looks at us for what we really are in terms of the lessons and the leadership that we've been able to provide, whether it's what to do or what not to do. There's still an opportunity. I like to say that Detroit is the classroom for the rest of the world. And people pay attention, whether it be the auto industry, whether it be the unfortunate crisis in Flint, or whether it be tradition of resources like Motown music, whether it be the booming social enterprise network, whether it be strong black men walking around every day who don't get the respect and attention they deserve, but are still trying to tell their story through the Men of Courage project with Ford Motor Company and Sean Wilson. Those things matter. The fact that we have so much to offer in a very large geography that's not necessarily functioning at an optimal level, but more than anything, we keep reinventing ourselves, and the world wants to know how to do that because a lot of places around the world have failed, and we keep doing it. You knock us down, we get up. I think that people finally believe. You know, you have to believe in yourself first, and I think that people finally believe. Um, I think that there are some who have doubts because, again, it's not trickling down to everybody, but there are champions who are taking that on. Tanya Allen from the Skillman Foundation, for example, is the people's champion. She talks about, well, people say there's uh, old Detroit and a new Detroit. She says it's our Detroit. And keep this in mind. The mayor says every neighborhood has a future. It won't be the same in every neighborhood. This city will never be what it was. And that's the thing that we have to embrace is that we can't go backwards. We can learn from that. We can deal with the real issues. There's some things that are jacked up. But what are you going to do about it? And that's the kind of environment I grew up in. No matter how the deck is stacked up against me as a young black male, I have to get up, go to work, get done, and build for the future. My mother raised me that way. And there's a lot more people in Detroit like that than people realize. And I think the world sees it. And I think we need to start rec- waking up and recognizing that we can get it done. Now, are we going to change everything? Are we going to solve world peace? No. Are we going to end racism? Probably not. But we can make a difference on our block, in our neighborhood, in our city, in our region, and hopefully impact the state and provide lessons and role models for the rest of the country and the world. That is what matters. You are an exceptional leader making an exceptional difference. Thank you very much. No, thank you. I appreciate the time. Wow, those were some deeply inspiring ideas we just heard from Marlo. It is an exceptional, exceptional person in an exceptional city. And Misty, I know that many of the highlighted um, thoughts that Marlo had was uh, uh, something that we could almost quote. Well, one that struck me right away was um, about halfway through, right in the middle of the podcast, he said that everybody's not going to be an architect, but you have to find ways to allow them to participate. Yeah, I think that's such a profound thought because I I think that's absolutely right. Few can really blueprint what you're building. But that doesn't mean that everybody doesn't play a role somewhere. And I think sometimes we forget if you're not the one who actually created the blueprint, you can't play. And that's just not right. And it goes back to the buy-in that we believe is so important in any project, especially one that has that's change-driven because if you don't have the buy-in to create something new, you're really not going to get it off the ground. So all good leaders have to remember that everybody can play a role and everybody should play a role. And it really becomes the leader's opportunity to try to find ways where everybody can engage and can participate. And that, Misty, reminds me of even 
uh, his title, which is Chief Engagement Strategist. I when I read that, I was just blown away. Yeah, that's cool, isn't it? Isn't it? And he he mentions engagement a lot, but not just engaging people, activating them, which is sort of the the step two of engaging. You can engage somebody, and it can be a, a quick, brief, you know, ten second interaction. They're engaged. What is that doing to activate them? So if you're the leader and you're creating this blueprint and you're having people participate, right? What you're saying is participation is not the same as engagement. And engagement, as I listen to this information, is inspiring, it's owning, it's allowing. And so it's it's very different than just getting people to do. And I hear, heard that in Marlowe's, um, just his delivery, his stories, his, his belief system. He isn't there just to show up. He is showing up and making change. That passion that any leader can show, which we just listened to, that passion is absolutely what makes that blueprint special and different than any other blueprint and what people will use to evaluate whether they will engage in, whether that leader can be that passionate. Before we get too far down this um, topic, I want to go back to something else he said right after his his wise words about not everybody can be an architect. We can't forget to invite people. It's not a one-time invitation because maybe it won't work for them now, but you have to invite people to participate over and over again. You know, that's really interesting because we assume that if we put up something really cool that everybody will just gravitate toward it, towards it. But I think in a, in a way, a lot of people come a certain distance and then they stop waiting for that invitation to come to the real point where you want them to come to. So I think it's, you're absolutely right, Misty, just because you build it doesn't mean that they will come. You have to build it, allow them people to be attracted to it, and then really invite them in to play a critical role in its, in its success. And invite them in different ways because you don't know, maybe they're just declining because it hasn't hit their, their sweet spot or really intrigued them or they haven't found how they can be an active participant in it. That's a great way to look at how you have to reverse your thought process. And, you know, it's, it's easy for me to know how I want to be invited into things. But I'm pretty sure, Misty, that's not the same as the way you want to be invited into things. And so we always have to be very mindful of how it impacts that other individual. I think I remember, I hope I get this phrase right, Marlo said, um, it's inclusive exposure. And I like that, that to get that, those two words together because you, you're bringing everyone together and exposing them, but what you don't know is what you're going to get out of that. So you, they're, they're included, but they all have their, their own perceptions and their own ideas that they bring to the table. What I learned, having had a chance to um, listen like you did, Misty, was that this... Um, butterfly effect that he feels very strongly about allows the energy to get started. And I think as a leader, you can do some directing, but the really cool part about it is you let that energy somewhat drive where you end up going. No, and he has so much energy behind it. It's it's contagious. I think a leader is well versed in allowing that energy to take on its life and instead of controlling it and dictating the outcome, really allowing that energy to far surpass any outcome that you could have ever predetermined in your blueprint design. In the same vein of of quotes and and great sound bites that he gave us to to ponder, um, he, he brings up a good point for change makers, that it's not up to us to define it, but to identify great work and bring people together. That's really what's a a very profound statement, Misty, and that's so true that we sometimes evaluate, usually wrongly, what the quality of someone's work is, and and instead, we really need to let the marketplace, we really need to let other people, we need to let the environment react to whatever the, um, whatever it is that was created. I think we'd be surprised when we let it go and let the total evaluate it. Yeah, when I was listening to this interview, I actually rewound it and and listened to that little piece again and let it sink in because when I thought about it, it it really isn't up to us to to define it. You can have some good ideas and put it together and let it define itself. Let it emerge because that's going to be your unique value. That's going to be your core driving um, involvement in something. I'm going to guess these podcasts for me are a little bit like the podcast for other people too. You listen to a certain part, something triggers in your brain and off you go and you start thinking about something and you've actually kind of forgot about the podcast until you come back and a few minutes have gone on and you really don't know what they were saying. Go back and rewind. The 
the really neat part about these podcasts, because you can you have the entire content captured, is listen to them multiple times. I mean, sometimes in our busy day, we think, Whew, I got I, I listened to another one. That's good. But you know it's like a library. Sometimes you got to go back and pull these key elements together because there's a lot to absorb. Absolutely. That's well said and really good advice. So, so savor those things and find out when you hear something that strikes you, find out what strikes you about it and then how you can apply it to your life. Because if you're ready for a change, let's make sure it's a change that lasts. Let's make it pure reinvention. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pure Reinvention. Keep the conversation going and get alerts when new podcasts are up by following us on Twitter at Pure Reinvention or sign up for our mailing list at pureinvention.com.